Hey guys, thanks so much for all the support. If you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, please feel free to do so. Whenever I remember her, my heart is filled with happiness and grief. The one I wanted to be my forever. Memories of the days I spent with her now feel like an inaccessible dream. Her hearty laughter still plays in my ears like a beautiful melody. The warmth she imprinted on my body lingers at every inch of my skin. Even though my heart breaks into a million pieces every day in her absence, I've come to enjoy longing for her, for I know there will come a day when I will finally reunite with her. Even though I didn't want to be here, I was at this fancy expensive restaurant whose even cheapest dishes were out of my budget against my will. I sometimes wonder why people make friends. Is that so they can be the sacrificial lamb in there instead? Like I was feeling at that moment. The more out of place I felt at that restaurant, the more regret I felt for being friends with Lance. As I was focused on the menu, trying to decide if I shouldn't eat and only let my so-called blind date order whatever she wanted for herself, perhaps I could escape the rest until my next salary. I heard a knock on the table. I raised my head only for my eyes to meet with a pair of green ones that were covered with shadowy makeup, making them appear even dreamier than they were. Are you my Valentine, Marcus? I'm Natalie. Her slow, soothing voice met my ears, and I couldn't help but nod my head in the affirmation, although I was not the Marcus she was looking for. She gave a dazzling smile before pulling out a chair and sitting across the table. As I was mesmerized by her beauty, she was looking at me and apologizing for inconveniencing me. She said her friends pushed her for this date because they felt pity that she was always alone on this day of the year. Upon checking the menu, she hesitantly looked at me and asked, Should we go somewhere else? I realized she felt uncomfortable with overly prized dishes as well. Feeling a bit more comfortable in her presence, I nodded my head yes, and we headed out. She then suggested a few places nearby that served great food at reasonable prices, so we went to one of those. I don't recall what happened with my actual date or the real Marcus, but I sure remember turning off my phone so no one could disturb my time with this angel. We talked for hours while enjoying our meal. She was the one mostly doing the talking, and I was lost in her melodious voice. Her calling me Marcus made me feel bad, so I decided to come clean. As I told her what truly happened, she silently stared at me briefly before saying, I know. I figured you weren't him since you weren't the self-centered chatterbox I talked to over the phone yesterday. After that, she just laughed, and I couldn't help but laugh with her. Fair to say, I had fallen hard for her. Before I met her, I never knew I could love someone. We started dating, and trust me, every second of my life that I spent with her was the best. We would record small things that we did and would watch them later together. I asked her to move in with me after six months of dating, and she did. I wished everything would stay like this forever, but little did I know, it was just my wishful thinking. That day when I was in the office, I got a call from her, but before I could answer it, my boss Rose asked me immediately to show her the proposal I was working on. It was weird, since I had just started it two days ago and there was still time left until I finished it, but she made it sound like I was past my submission date. I had to re-explain the proposal multiple times, which made me feel she was deliberately picking on me. About an hour later, I returned to my desk, frustrated and exhausted. I grabbed some water and gulped it in one go before looking at my phone. It had 10 missed calls from Natalie. I tried calling her back, but her phone was turned off. I started getting worried, so I decided to head home early and see if everything was alright. However, when I went to inform the boss about it, she looked at me with a weird expression before saying, No, finish your work before leaving unless you want to get a week's worth of your pay cut. Frustrated, I turned to my desk and started moving my hands as fast as possible. After every 10 minutes, I tried calling her, but her phone was still turned off. I started wondering what it could be that she called me so many times. 
I managed to finish my work in the next two hours, and this time I didn't go to the boss to inform her about it. Instead, I headed directly to my car. After about half an hour, I reached our house, but I tried to open the door. I found it unlocked. An unsettling feeling formed in my stomach as I rushed inside to find her. As I searched for her everywhere, a sinking feeling lingered in my heart that I couldn't shake off. When I entered her bathroom, my heart stopped upon seeing her lying unconscious. I rushed to her side and started checking for her pulse, and it was a relief that she was still alive. I immediately picked her up and dashed to my car. After carefully placing her on the seat, I started the ignition and rushed to the hospital. Upon entering the lobby, I screamed for help, and two attendants rushed to my side. They placed her on a stretcher and headed to the emergency room while I anxiously followed them. Despite my wishes for her well-being, I was too late. Half an hour after admitting her, the doctors approached me with a saddened expression and informed me that she couldn't make it. I asked them what was the cause, but they said they didn't know either. Her heart stopped for some reason. It had to be a mistake. When I checked, she was alive, and there was no way I could accept that she was dead just like that. I begged the doctors to save her, but no matter how much I pleaded and cried in front of them, they all kept repeating the same sentence. I'm sorry, sir. There's nothing we can do now. I sometimes feel like what I saw in the news about the boy stabbing the girl publicly to death could happen to me any day now. It won't be with a knife or anything. Well, you never know. It could be. But judging through my condition, it would be different. I can even picture the headlines now. A woman of the age of 32 was beaten to death by her husband. The stab marks appear to be from a broken alcohol bottle. Her in-laws knew what was going on behind that closed door, but decided to put a blind eye on them. This was not the first time I had pictured such a headline. Every time I was brutally beaten after his returns from one of those drinking parties, I would always stare at the wall for hours with my aching wounds thinking of such things. I knew he'd end up killing me one of these days, but I just wasn't sure what day it would be. He's a loving and devoted husband during the day when he's sober, but his personality takes a 180 turn at night when he beats me to a pole. It's like he's an entirely different person after drinking, one I can't recognize. I couldn't stop my trail of thoughts as I wiped my tears and looked at him sleeping in our bed peacefully, while I sat on the floor with my aching body unable to move because of the twinging in my cuts and wounds. This was nothing compared to my constant mental agony. At least now I was sure that he would not touch me till the next time he drinks, but the perturbation I felt whenever he was outside or was going to be late was the kind of misery I don't want anymore. Looking at the shattered pieces of the broken bottle, I knew in my mind that I had to clean all this before morning so he doesn't step on it after waking up, but a part of me wanted it to happen after everything he put me through. I looked over at the wall clock to see the time. It was two in the morning. One hour remained till our four-year-old daughter Aisha woke up. So I somehow gathered the strength left in me, pulled out the glass pieces from my leg, and stood up. Before doing any cleaning, I went to apply disinfectant so it doesn't fester. Trust me, it hurts like hell cleaning all these wounds. Tears were still flowing at a constant pace, but I made sure to not let a single fragment of the voice out of my mouth. After I was done cleaning and applying disinfectant, I went to grab a broom, wiper, and dust pan to clean the mess he made. I returned to the room and gave a scan of all the whiskey spread on the floor before I started cleaning. I didn't want to sleep next to the man who had exhibited the embodiment of a monster in front of me a few hours ago, so I just sat on the sofa that was beside the wardrobe. But before I could put my head down, I heard Aisha's cry. She was in my mother-in-law's room where I had put her after she fell asleep because I had to sense the drunkenness in Ryan's voice over the call. As I was walking out of the room, I saw my mother-in-law carrying her to our room. She averted her eyes knowing the state I was in because of his son. I didn't say anything either, but smiled knowingly, sending more guilt to her direction. I took Aisha from her lap and walked back to the room to console her. The morning came. 
I hadn't gotten a single wink of sleep, but I still went to the kitchen to make breakfast for everyone. Everyone knew my condition, but not a single one in the family came forward to say I didn't have to do it or at least help me. When I carried the tray into the room to give breakfast to my husband, he had just gotten up. He looked at me, remembering what he did to me last night, and asked me to come closer to him. I knew what was going to happen when he leaned his head on my shoulder. He apologized as always. I gave him a forced smile without saying a word in response as I placed breakfast on the side table. It was Sunday, so I didn't have to go to work. I guess I forgot to mention that I work as a teacher in a nearby school, and my subject is science. I wanted to become a veterinarian, but I couldn't pursue it after my marriage looking at how my husband was against it. But somehow, he allowed me as a teacher. Anyway, my friend called me a few minutes earlier and told me that they would be dropping by, so I started preparing snacks for them. Since I don't have any strength left to cook, I just prepared the store-brought ones. She arrived in the evening with her three cute daughters and started telling me about how she had finally gotten approval on her leave and that she'd be heading to her hometown with her family. She was working as a radiographer in the Holly Family Hospital and also had a degree in homeopathy. Looking at how her husband let her complete her studies even after marriage and the amount of support he was providing her, I couldn't help but feel envious. The way she blushed to her ears even after three kids on the slightest mention of her husband's name said so much about how he treated her. She didn't need to boast about it. Anyone with eyes could see how happy she looked. I've always seen her husband treating her with respect, addressing her as op when talking to her. Op means you, and this word states a form of respect. I was in the kitchen preparing for dinner after my friend left when I received a phone call from Ryan. He informed me that he would be coming home late as he had encountered one of his old friends. I knew he was going to drink the moment he said that. You would think that Muslims don't drink since it's Haram, just like Maram's husband, but no. These days not many people are real Muslims just because they claim to be. Just take my husband as an example. He not just drinks, but he beats his wife and the mother of his child. My body started to shiver. I started getting panic attacks as I realized that this was going to be another barbarity of his. I had to escape it by any means necessary. I looked around the house, only to find everyone in the living room locked inside watching some drama together on the television. It was my chance. I went to my room, packed mine and Aisha's things, and before anyone could notice, I got out of the house. I strode across the road, still scared of getting discovered. The only thing I did was break my SIM card and buy a new one. Then I informed my father about everything, including that I had left home yet again. I had run away multiple times before and went to my parents' house in Bihar, India, but ended up returning after hearing his cries and pleas along with the promises to never harm me before. The intention of me running then was to make him stop hurting me. But this time, I was determined to never return, no matter what. This time, I was ready to get a divorce from him, and my father, as always, was going to support my decision. When my boss Rose asked what I'd be up to this 14th of February, I couldn't say I would be drinking in my living room, sitting at my recliner alone while reminiscing about my ex-lover. To make myself look like one of them who would be getting some, I told her I had a date with a hot girl whom I'd met recently. I was sure she bought my lies. I mean, who wouldn't? I have a hunky physique and I'm over six feet tall. And just by hearing my voice, women swoop at my feet. Despite that, she had a bitter look on her, almost as if she was hoping I would say I was spending time alone that day. I couldn't care less about her feelings more than mine, so I went to my desk to finish up my work. There were times when I caught my boss's eye lingering on me more than they should, but I never thought of it much. Thoughts of Aria, the love of my life who passed away two years ago due to an unknown cause, had already occupied my heart, mind, and soul to think of another woman. However, I knew if I were to say that I was still hung up on her, people would think I was pathetic. That was why I would try to avoid others, thinking I was single, and would tell them every once in a while that I had a date. That evening, when I was getting off work, Rose called me in her office and asked me to help her with some work. 
I was butt tired and didn't want to do it. But after working here for the past six years, I learned that if you want to work without any trouble, you should never piss your boss off. So I agreed. The work she was making me do was mostly hers which was piled up. It made me wonder if she ever even did them. Weirder was that she was not helping me finish up her shit, instead she just sat on her comfy couch. An hour went by and I was exhausted. That was when I saw her placing a cup of coffee in front of me and said, drink up, before returning to her couch. I was so frustrated that I wanted to throw the damn coffee at her face, but I controlled myself and started sipping it. Normally, drinking coffee made my sleep disappear, but that time it was doing the opposite. I started to feel even drowsier and didn't even realize when I passed out. When I woke up, I was having a throbbing headache, and as I returned to my senses, I realized my body was covered with bruises while I was butt naked. Panicked, I got up and scanned my surroundings, trying to make sense of what was happening. That was when I started getting minor flashes of what happened last night. I immediately got up, picked up my shattered clothes, and dressed up, and as I was about to head out, Rose entered with a seductive smile, which only felt disgusting, and reminded me of how she forced herself on me last night. I stomped to her and grabbed her arms tightly before asking, What did you do? She acted shy upon my question and responded, It was not just me who did it. She then slipped her dress, revealing the bite marks on her body. Just don't call me Natalie next time when we are making love. The moment she mentioned my ex's name, I got enraged and grabbed her by the hair. Next time, you won't be alive if you try anything. As I growled that, she let out a moan, stating she liked it, but it only made me feel more disgusted. I turned around and dashed out of her office, and then the building. Once I reached home, I went to take a bath. I tried rubbing her filthy marks off of me, but it was of no use. That evening, I typed in my resignation letter and sent it to HR. I started looking for a new job, luckily within two days. The pay was not as much as the last one, but it was still good. It was finally Valentine's Day, and I felt filthy every time I recalled the events of that night. I wanted to drown in my sorrow and forget about everything, only remembering my good memories with my angel. As I opened the refrigerator, I realized I had only four beer bottles and it wasn't enough to make me forget about what happened. I grabbed my car keys and went to the store to buy some more beer. After returning, I put on our tape and started watching my beautiful girl while drinking. That was when I heard someone laughing behind me. I turned around only to be horrified upon seeing Rose. She looked at me and said while holding her laughter, Is that whom you had a date with? Your dead ugly girlfriend? Her laugh was like nails to my ears, piercing in painfully, and before I knew it, I felt something red in front of my eyes, and the next thing I knew, I was sitting on top of Rose rearranging her face. I punched her to my heart's content, but the psycho kept laughing and making an expression as if she was enjoying getting hit by me. I grabbed her by the neck and began choking her. She was still smiling, but when it started getting harder for her to breathe, she realized I wasn't joking when I warned her about killing her. As I saw her expression changing into a horror with each passing second as her feeble life slipped away, I started feeling better. I turned around and watched the scene where Natalie and I were dancing together, playing on the screen. Tears started slipping out of my eyes as I uttered, my voice barely above a whisper. Don't worry, my love. I promise to be only yours forever. What in the world is going on with me? Why is everything going wrong left and right? We were on vacation, but since the day I arrived, problems followed me at every step. First, I started having stomach problems and could not enjoy anything at all. And when finally my health got better, I came for night diving at my friend's suggestion and thought it would be a new experience as well as adventurous. But first, my gear was defective, so I had to go back to the surface to change into a different one. Then they couldn't find my size for some time. 
At last, when I got back inside the sea and was exploring the beautiful world underwater, we had to encounter this bloated dead body. As if the predicaments would have stopped there, now we were running away from that rotting corpse that's chasing us. I don't want to jinx it more than it already has by saying, can it get any worse? My guys must be confused. Let's go back and flash back to the day when it all started. Three days earlier. Hey Orson, what are you doing this week? I was staring at the ceiling while leaning on the recliner while I heard Elias, so I turned my head to get full access to his face. Nothing, just getting bored since the entire week's off. He wasn't even surprised by my wearisome tone as I spoke. That's good then. Pack your bags. I booked us tickets. We're going on a vacation. I jolted up, unable to believe what my ears just heard. A vacation? But where? I asked out of curiosity. Don't worry, it's somewhere nice. Why? Don't you want to come? He was about to walk out the door, but then turned around to ask. Oh, I'm coming. I can't stand this dull routine any longer. My voice was full of enthusiasm now that I had heard of a way out of these uninteresting days. It wasn't just the two of us, but the other two numbskulls were coming as well. The four of us shared an apartment, and while Elias and I shared a room, Wayne and Caspian shared the other one. So while boarding the plane, it was revealed to us that we were heading to Alaska for our vacation. I don't know if we were the chocolate that I ate on the plane or something, but the moment we landed at our destination, my stomach started to ache. I rested for an entire 24 hours while the others enjoyed sightseeing and whatnot, but I recovered after taking a few pills and getting some good rest. After that, I visited a few places along with them, and the very same night, Wayne suggested that we try night diving. Not only that, they immediately brought tickets for us, and since it was here for fun, I thought, why not? Let's try this as well while we're here. They told us a few hand signs in case of emergency, and gave us diving gear before leading us underwater. As we were diving around, I felt water getting inside through my mask, so I signaled to one of the divers who were guiding us that I needed to go up, and then followed him. I told the guy that water was getting inside my mask, so we checked, and it turned out my gear was defective. He had a few more, so we started looking for one that would be my size. It took the guy a while to find one in my size, and right after changing into different gear, I was led back inside the water where the rest of them were enjoying. As we went a bit deeper into the water, I noticed something weird so I went ahead to check what it was. Others noticed me going out of the way, so they followed me. I could tell each of us went pale the moment our eyes landed on the dead body of a man. It seemed he had drowned here to his death recently. The guide instructed that we should head back and report this now, but before we could go back, I swear that corpse opened its eyes and started swimming in our direction. Okay, back to the present. We were panicking and trying to get away from what we presumed to be probably a ghost or something. Can't explain a water zombie to be exact. And in attempts to do that, we swam away from the shore and ended up getting in the middle of the sea. By the looks of it, we had somehow managed to do away with that ghost as it seemed he wasn't following us any longer. But unfortunately, we ended up somewhere far more dangerous as we noticed we were surrounded by water. And since we had no idea which way to swim to get to the shore, we stayed still hoping that the guides would come back for the four of us. As we were in the dilemma, we noticed a party ship heading in our direction. A moment of relief rushed over us as we started shouting and waving to get its attention, and thank God we succeeded. They led us on the boat and gave us a few towels to dry ourselves. Judging by the amount of preparation, there was a party going on there and we noticed people dancing and having fun as we rested in a corner. Let's just say I've got the worst luck of all our problems did not end up boarding the ship either. Right after we sat on the ship's floor to catch some breath, we heard of a commotion about a young woman around her 20s who had been missing for quite some time. They looked all over the place, but were unable to find her. The way she went missing made it seem like she was never there in the first place. Just when people thought maybe she fell in the water and drowned when no one was watching, another girl similar to her age appeared into thin air. It didn't just end there, because as everyone was panicking while looking around for two vanished women, a third woman in her late 20s had gone as her boyfriend said she was nowhere to be found. Anxiety, fear, panic, 
I could sense all sort of emotions coming from the people on the ship, and it wasn't going to be long before they started pointing their fingers at the newcomers on the boat, meaning us. I have seen many horror and crime documentaries to figure out that we had just landed in the mouth of another danger, and this situation seemed to involve a serial killer at that. There was no other possible explanation for two women to go missing one by one other than someone making them disappear, and the ship wasn't that big for anyone to hide them, so probably whoever the killer was, he or she threw them into the sea after getting done with them. Elias went to the bathroom, but was taking too long to return, so the rest of us started to get concerned. As we were about to get up and go look for him, he came back all panicked and terrified, as if that water ghost had returned. But soon, we found out that there was a different reason for his strange behavior, when he pointed his fingers toward the third girl's boyfriend and said he saw him dragging the girl and then throwing her in the water. A few more people who were surrounding us heard him and the word reached everyone's ears within minutes. The guy was captured by the other men almost immediately, and those who had lost their loved ones by his hand demanded that he should be thrown into the sea. Since not a single one was in favor of not doing so, he was thrown in for real. No one bothered to ask or hear his explanation as to what he did to the girls and why would he kill them. Guess that was due to panic and fear that if he were to get lost, others might end up losing their lives. We were taken back to shore, and as we were returning to our hotel, the four of us realized that such vacations weren't for us, and we decided to head back home the next day. We talked among one another, and we would go to some bar or give bowling a chance instead of seeking such adventures where our lives would be on the line. You know that one guy who always gets the girl no matter how out of reach she might be? I'm him. Being born with good looks has always proven beneficial to me. There hadn't been a Valentine's Day gone by since I was 14 that I spent alone. But what happened in high school made me cautious about dating. It was the final year of high school and I was bored of the girl I had been dating for the past month. As Valentine's Day approached, I decided to spend the day with this new girl, Natalie, who had been sending me signals for the few days. Initially, I didn't plan on reciprocating her feelings, but the more I watched her, the more pull I felt toward her. I had to know what it was about her that made me so curious. After telling Bernie I couldn't see her anymore, I finally decided to date Natalie. However, I had heard from my friends that she had never dated before, which made me wonder how could it be possible for such a pretty girl to stay single till now. Three days before Valentine's Day, there was a party at my friend Zen's place. I knew she would be coming there because some of his girlfriends were friends with Natalie. Upon arriving at the party, the first person in my sight of view was her. She was dressed in this slick, backless teal dress, which her luscious raven hair was complimenting. I had never felt such attraction to any girl as I was feeling to her at that moment. I knew I had to ask her to be my valentine that day, no matter what so I began walking in her direction. However, before I could reach her, Justin, a sophomore from my school, approached her. He grabbed her hand and spun her around before she erupted in infectious laughter as he whispered something into her ear. Since my end goal was only to date her a few times before dumping her, I couldn't understand why I was so jealous that another dude was close to her. That was when another girl approached Justin and kissed him. I remembered seeing them together a few times on campus, so my guess was she was his girlfriend, which somehow made me feel relieved. I wanted to ask her out before any other guy butted in and swept her away, so I started searching for an opening where I could talk to her. But as I observed her, I realized she wasn't giving me signals. She was this way with everyone, and my dumbass misunderstood her. Even then, I was confident she would say yes, and when I noticed her leaving the crowd and heading toward the empty lobby, I started following her. She entered an empty room, and as she was about to close the door, I blocked it and got inside before locking it after me. Her surprised and panicked reaction felt charming for some reason, and I couldn't help myself. I pulled her to my chest and embraced her tightly. Her scent enveloped my senses. However, she pushed me with all her might and asked what I was doing. For some reason, I felt she was going to scream, so I quickly pushed her to the wall and put a hand over her mouth. 
She struggled to get away from my grip, but I was stronger and towered over her tiny physique. Being closer to her made me lose all of my senses and reason. I couldn't help trailing my fingers across her soft skin. The panic in her eyes shifted to sheer terror, making her resemble a prey who was about to be devoured by the predator. For some strange reason, I was enjoying it. I swept an arm under her legs and lifted her, my other hand grabbing her waist. She almost let out a yell as I threw her on the bed before pouncing on her and shutting her mouth. With each graze of her skin, shivers sparked in me and I instinctively moved even closer, only an inch distance between us. She struggled, kicked, punched with all her might, but I felt none of them. Instead, I enjoyed touching her. As my tongue was about to delve inside her mouth, I felt a stinging pain in my back. Puzzled, I looked at her whose eyes looked no more frightened. I noticed her hair, which was tied in a bun, now open. That was when I felt another stab, and the unbearable pain made me lose my grip on her. As she pushed me off of her and slipped away, I noticed her clenching a hair stick laced with blood, probably mine. Only then did I realize she had stabbed me with it. How did I not see her wearing that? As I wondered that, a cloud of black smoke started to spread across my senses, and the last thing I saw before blacking out was her escaping the room. I opened my eyes to a white ceiling whose color was fading away. Unable to comprehend what had happened, I continued staring at the roof in a daze. The concerned voices of Zen and a few other people I saw at the party caught my attention. They asked what had happened and who did this to me, but I was unable to respond. I couldn't think of what I should tell them. It wasn't like I could say the girl I thought wanted me, not only was she not interested in me, but I forced myself on her and got stabbed in the process. It was the first time I didn't get the girl I wanted, and also was badly injured by her. I was trying to think of what to do. I saw her standing at the end of the crowd and I heard someone say, If it wasn't for Natalie, you could have bled to death. Thank God she found you when she did. As I stared at her, turning around and disappearing, I couldn't help but think. Perhaps it was wrong of me to do what I did to her. And maybe, just maybe, if I took a different approach, I could have gotten the girl this time, too. For context, I am female and currently 21 years old, though at the time of this event I was 16 years old. I have never viewed myself as an attractive person. I've always been kind of chubby, I had bad acne in my teen years, I never cared at all what I wore, and I almost never wore makeup. I was an extremely awkward teen who had barely any friends and next to no self-esteem due to a very abusive relationship I had a few years prior, but that's a different story entirely. My point is that I was a completely different person during this time and looking back, I know how naive I was and what I should have done instead to better protect myself. So it was the year 2015 and I was going on my very first cruise with my family. It was an 8 days, 7 nights cruise that was taking place a few days after a tsunami had passed nearby. After a rocky start, literally the boat rocked back and forth the first two days and everyone was miserable, and me suffering a slight panic attack during a routine evasion drill, I'm claustrophobic and really hate crowds, it ended up being one of the best weeks of my life and I thoroughly enjoyed myself. Some of the downsides to this cruise was the fact that it was a North State cruise taking place in October, which meant chilly weather and no swimming, and because it was during a school year, I was the only guest my age on that cruise. The closest age to me I think was either 6 years old or 40 years old, so that kind of stunk, although I did end up crushing hard on our assistant dinnertime waiter who was around 30 years old and had the sweetest smile I'd ever seen. Anyways, time to get to the meat of the story. So as far as I know, most cruises have at least one formal night where everyone dresses up really nice for dinner and they serve special meals like lobster, steak, etc. As I said before, I wasn't the most attractive person out there, but I did doll myself up for this special occasion. I wore a turquoise knee-length dress, tan-colored high heels, my mom curled my blonde hair, and I put on some makeup that really made my blue eyes pop. 
I honestly did feel kind of pretty that night. Dinner was amazing and I finally got to try lobster tail for the first time. Loved it. I also, of course, made eyes and mildly flirted with our assistant waiter. I made him laugh because of how red my face would get whenever my dad called me out on it. So after our dinner, my family and I all decided to go our separate ways for the night. There was a bunch of events going on that each of us wanted to get to. Well, except for me, who spent most of the cruise finding random relaxing spots to sit and draw. I was, and I've always been, an avid artist. So anyways, after a couple of hours, I decided I wanted to find my dad for some reason that I don't exactly remember. My mom had told me that he was going to the karaoke thing going on, so I started making my way around the ship, looking for wherever this was happening at. That's when I met him. I noticed him staring at me, and at first it was flattering. Like I said, I was average looking and had next to no self-esteem, so having anyone of the opposite sex look at me and smiling made me feel good. He looked to be not too much older than I was and was dressed in a cruise employee uniform, so I decided to approach him and ask if he knew where the karaoke room was. His smile never left as I asked him, and in a thick Indian accent he told me that he didn't know, but that we could search together for it. I thought it was a little weird at first that he was an employee but didn't know where an event was taking place, but I brushed it off and thought it was possible for some newer employees to not know where everything was yet. So he and I started walking around the ship together and casually chatted while doing so. He told me his name was Felix and was 21 years old. He also, as I suspected, did recently start working for this cruise liner a few months ago. For the record, I did find him kind of cute and liked how comfortable he felt talking to me about his life. As we continued walking around, he told me about how he was born and raised in India, how his family was kind of poor how rooster fights were illegal back home, but he watched them anyways and stuff like that. I enjoyed listening to his stories about life in a different country, considering I've never been anywhere but America at this point in my life. We had eventually stopped looking for my dad and were just walking and talking together. We were now standing outside on the deck and leaning against the railing. I admired how beautiful and ominous the dark water reflected the stars. It was as if we were floating in the galaxy. It was completely beautiful. He then started telling me how lonely he was and how hard it is working on a cruise ship and watching hundreds of couples being romantic together while he has no one. I told him that I understood how he felt because I was also single and hated feeling alone. He looked at me and told me he was surprised that I don't have a boyfriend because of how beautiful I was. I blushed and looked away as I told him that most guys back home don't look at me twice and he was surprised by that. You know that feeling when someone or something is behind you, and you can't see it, but you know you can sense it's there? Well, I felt something behind my head, and when I turned around to find out what it was, before I realized what was happening, Felix's face was right in mine, and he planted an unexpected kiss on me. I pulled back in surprise, and he asked me what I thought about it. I stuttered nervously and tried to think of a reply. Now yes, I was a naive young person who was always looking positively at people, but I wasn't completely stupid. This is a 21-year-old stranger who was flirting with a 16-year-old girl. I also had the sudden realization that no one knew where I was or who I was with. Before I could even say anything, Felix started telling me how he knew of a couple of spots on this ship where we could be alone to do things together. I started panicking and really wanted to get away from him. Now another fault of mine is that I'm way too nice for my own good, and I'm always afraid of hurting people's feelings or coming across as a mean person, even when I'm clearly in a dangerous situation. I'm still too friendly to everyone now, but nowadays, I have much more of a backbone and wouldn't have a problem telling someone like Felix to kindly screw off. But as I said, I didn't have that confidence back then, and I had no clue how to get out of the situation. Felix put his arm around my waist and started guiding me toward one of the areas he was talking about. I started stuttering. Um, maybe we shouldn't. We just met and I... We might get caught and you'd be in trouble and my father might be looking for me. I know that sounds dumb, but I was trying to make him think of ways where this could be bad for him, so it seemed like I was trying to look out for him. Don't judge me too harshly. 
He told me not to worry about it because people mess around with staff sometimes and their boss never finds out. That only made me panic even more. He leaned in for another kiss and I stupidly let him because I was scared of making him angry. After the long, uncomfortable kiss, I slightly turned away and told him I just wanted to keep looking at the night sky. He insisted that we should start messing around because we don't have much time together. I tried to hold back from crying at this point. And by the grace of the good lord above, my phone suddenly made a noise and I noticed my father had texted me asking where I was. I tried to mask my relief, but I immediately told Felix that I had to get going because my dad was wondering where I was and that he was very protective of me. Felix showed his disappointment to me saying that, but then he asked me for my phone number. My heart sank and I gave it to him. Again, stupid young female who doesn't know how to say no. I'm aware of how foolish that was. It was a good thing I didn't give him a fake though because he immediately texted my number to prove its authenticity. Once I thought he was satisfied, I started saying goodbye and walking away. He grabbed my wrists and spun me back toward him and asked for a hug goodbye first. I sheepishly agreed and gave him a light hug. I wanted to start crying when he squeezed me tight and pulled me against his groin and asked if I could feel it, if you know what I mean. I quickly stepped away and sped walked towards my hotel room. I made sure he didn't follow me and once I was safely inside my room, I hopped on my bed and started crying. Of course, I couldn't tell my parents about this because I would be in trouble for putting myself in this situation, or so I thought. I promise my parents aren't really like that. I know now that in reality my former marine father would have tracked Felix down and let him know to never touch his daughter again. A few minutes into my cry and my phone vibrated with a text from an unknown number claiming it was Felix. I wanted to block him immediately but again, stupidly, I was afraid that would anger him and he would somehow find me. So I answered him and we talked for a few minutes. We kept talking about how he wanted to see me again before I left the next day which at this point I repeatedly thanked God for and I kept telling him that it just wasn't possible because my parents didn't want me leaving my room for the rest of the night, which was a lie. I did eventually end up leaving my room and asked an older female employee where the karaoke event was, which she immediately took me to. Side note, the room was literally two hallways down from where I first found Felix and I kicked myself for that later. I found my dad and didn't leave his side for the whole rest of the night. Luckily, I was able to enjoy the rest of my night dancing around with my father and I did hide around him whenever I spotted Felix walking around who was making it obvious that he was looking for me. I know the story isn't as scary as the most on here but at the time, it was terrifying to me and my own kindness could have got me into a very bad situation. The moral to my story is that everyone needs to be careful when going on cruises or other types of vacations. Just because someone wears an employee uniform doesn't mean they're trustworthy. There's many people out there who take advantage of kind people and want to use that against them. Just please make sure whoever you're with always knows where you are and don't put yourself into risky situations. There had been many times since I was a child when I heard from the people closest to me that they had heard or witnessed urban legends coming alive in their own eyes, but I never believed them. But something happened at my friend's wedding that might not be an urban legend, but it sure as hell was something that related to some myth that came true, as those people could not be living humans. My name is Stephen Williams, a 28-year-old Navy officer. I took a few days off to attend my best friend's wedding, which they had planned to get hitched on a yacht. So I helped them with their wedding preparations since I loved the ocean a lot and felt a different connection with it. It was like I had a purpose to serve. That was also one of the reasons why I joined the Navy in the first place. That day I got up early and got ready in a nice suit to attend their wedding. After admiring me looking handsome in the mirror for a few minutes, I left for the port. Soon after reaching there, the ship took off right after all the guests arrived, and right after the preparations were double-checked to see if anything was missing. As I was boarding, I saw a sign that said, A little bit of mercy makes the world less cold and more just. I don't get it. Why would someone put a board like that on wedding decorations? Sailing deep into the Atlantic, 
I could feel the salty air on my face, which felt quite good as you may know as well if you've been on the deck of a ship. That ocean breeze hits entirely differently. So I closed my eyes and stood by the edge of the ship's deck. The soul-soothing ocean breeze made me forget the passage of time. And then I came back to my senses when I heard the announcement on the ship about the bride's arrival. I turned back to the wedding venue where two of my best friends were getting married, Mariah and Carl. A perfect wedding for a perfect couple. There were only 20 guests on the yacht, and after the wedding ceremony's completion, the plan was to stay on Bermuda Island and enjoy some camping for two nights before returning. Mariah and Carl took their vows, everyone started celebrating along with the other guests, and by the time we reached the island, all of us were drunk and hammered. Upon reaching the island, we encountered a group of beautiful women who were dancing around a bonfire. Everyone was intrigued to see them, and one of my best friends, Peter, who was also a common friend of Mariah and Carl's, went straight to talk to them and even invited them to join our party. I found it weirdly uncomfortable and unnecessary to invite them, and said in my mind that it looked like a witch's ritual. While I was lost in my thought, I heard an unnaturally beautiful voice that sounded like the ocean. I turned my head in the direction of the voice and saw a dark-haired, beautiful woman standing in front of me. Her beauty was almost unreal. She wore an emerald stone on her neck, which made her look even more beautiful. I could feel it, even in my bones, that something was not normal about these women. But for some reason, I couldn't speak about my doubts, as if I was under a spell. A few months ago while working, I heard from one of my coworkers that we were giving our opinions about urban legends about creatures who have beautiful, irresistible voices, but they are man-eating monsters. I was curious to explore this myth in depth, but now, having met these women, I was scared and confused, thinking, what if they are what they told me about? So I tried to distract my thoughts by joining the dance, and after it was done, I went to have the wedding dinner. For dinner, we were having seafood and wine. Well, anyone could say that the chefs did their job very well when they were preparing the food, as it tasted delightful. These women joined us for dinner as well, and started telling us about their traditions, which even sounded weird. That was when they said they wanted to give the newlyweds a special drink and sing a song for them as gifts. Mariah and Carl took their drinks, and as they were enjoying, these women started to sing. Their voices were so magical, and it felt easy on the ears. We kept listening to them till late at night while enjoying drinks and snacks that were presented to the guests. After they were done, they said their goodbyes and finally left us. It was midnight, and everyone was fast asleep inside their camps. When I heard a noise that felt like muffled crying, so I headed out of the camp. I found Lily out there crying in front of Carl and Mariah's camp. Lily was eight-year-old Carl's niece who had come with her mother, Sarah. Confused by her crying, I went forward and approached her. The moment she saw me, she started running, and by the looks of it, I had no other choice but to run after her. So I took a deep sigh and started running after her. When I caught up to her, she started crying even louder, and even though I tried to calm her down, she kept crying while saying, They took them! They took everyone with them! I couldn't understand what she was saying, until I blacked out after hearing a familiar singing voice, and by the time I came to my senses, I was near the ocean shore. One of the women from before was sitting next to me as I was lying on the ground looking drenched and cold. My head was throbbing so hard. I put my hands over my head and tried to stand up while asking her, Where am I? And what are you doing here? She didn't reply and kept quiet. That was when I remembered that I was with Lily, so I asked her if she knew where Lily was, but just like before, she didn't say anything. Instead, she pointed towards the ship. I didn't ask any more questions and ran towards the ship to look for Lily. I found her hiding in one of the rooms of the ship. So I took her and ran toward the campfire for some reason. I felt like I had to go there. I picked a burning log and set all the camps on fire, hoping that someone would come out. But no one was there. After that, I saw the woman again. 
but this time she communicated with me and said, Run, if you wish to survive. I took Lily in my arms, ran towards the ship, and went straight to the captain's room. After working in the Navy for almost two years, I knew a few things myself. At the very least, I knew handling a ship is not easy for a single man, but I had to do something. Lily fainted just after that, and I settled her down on a beach near me. I somehow managed to sail the boat on my own and pushed all the emergency help alerts. After sailing into the Atlantic for seven hours straight, I was exhausted and couldn't keep my eyes open for long. As I was losing consciousness, I couldn't help but hope for someone to come and save us. When I came to my senses, I was in the nursing room of another ship, and Lily was on a bed next to mine. I heard her telling the officers that the woman on an island killed everybody, and how after listening to their singing, everyone was under control. But a woman who was wearing an emerald green stone on her neck saved our lives. I was shocked to hear it because I thought she wanted to kill us since I couldn't read her eyes when they met mine. After we reached land, we were taken to the hospital and got our wounds treated. But the trauma we had been through was even greater. Lily's father got her discharged from the hospital and took her home while I was sleeping. Even though I felt relieved I could help but feel disturbed and sad about the lives that had been lost. When I was getting discharged, a nurse came by my room and gave me an envelope saying Lily left it for me. Inside the envelope was an emerald stone along with a letter which said, You are marked, so be ready, as one day I shall come for you. So before this whole lockdown thing happened and my dating life went to hell in a handbasket, I used to swipe through Tinder and Bumble quite a lot, looking for girls to hook up with. So I'm bored in my silver-like apartment one day when I come across this absolute smoke show of a girl who was listed under the name Lilith. She had these big green eyes, wore pigtails a lot in her profile pictures, and had absolutely no qualms of showing off this big peachy butt she had. She also had this goth girl vibe going, which was something I find really attractive. I mean, she was definitely not the kind of girl I'd bring home to mom, but that's not really what I'm looking for when I'm swiping, so naturally, I swipe right. Boom. We match. I think I actually let out this involuntary no way when the old it's a match text appeared and kind of cynically told myself, nah, she's a bot, this isn't real. But yup. It was real, and she was so cute to talk to. At first, anyway, because things started to go a little different when we actually met up. She worked at this coffee shop at the Getty and asked me if I wanted to pick her up after her shift so she could take me somewhere real special, which turned out to be the Museum of Death on Hollywood Boulevard. I mean, not my ideally romantic place to go on a first date, but like I said... She was a slam piece, and it was basically impossible to say no to her. So it was decided, and after I picked her up, she kept it a mystery for a while, only telling me to drive her to Hollywood Boulevard before revealing where she actually wanted to go. The area around the museum is kind of sketchy, but again, I'd have driven through way worse neighborhoods for a date with this girl, so I just pushed all my concerns to the back of my mind. Despite the interior being as dark and dingy as it was, looking like an over-clustered basement, the whole thing was actually kind of interesting at first. But I'd be lying if I said my eyes stayed on the exhibits the whole time, when they were pretty much glued to her butt whenever I wasn't going to get caught looking. It most definitely wasn't particularly creepy either, but the things that Lilith started to say to me as we were walking around the place did in a big, bad way too. Like I said, the exhibits were interesting, but that's all they were aside from being gross and spooky. There were death masks, body parts preserved in formaldehyde, all the things you might come to expect from a place called the Museum of Death, and then some. But this Lilith chick starts saying how pretty some of this stuff is, looking at it the way any other girl might look at a picture of a puppy or something. 
She then starts asking me all these weird questions about how I'd like to die. Yeah, how I'd like to die. I tell her I wouldn't like to die at all. I mean, it was legit the creepiest question I think I'd ever been asked, and she insists that everyone has a way they'd most want to die. I don't want to screw up the date or anything. She seemed crazy, and crazy girls can be real fun, if you catch my meaning, so I give her some throwaway response like, whatever way is most pain-free. She starts telling me how that was a boring answer and how she'd like to die of hypothermia because it apparently makes you feel all warm and sleepy towards the end. How some victims of hypothermia have even taken their clothes off before they died and just laid down in the snow or whatever before their heart stops beating. She also then gave me this long in-depth speech about how taking another person's life would be better than even getting intimate if you catch my drift. How that feeling of pure power must dwarf any feeling that drugs or alcohol have to offer. She then tells me how hot she thought it would be to watch me drown at the bottom of a pool while there's an audience and I'm totally naked. How it had actually turned her on to see my final moments of desperation before my body went limp and floated around the tank. Then something about how the Vikings would make wings out of the skin on a person's back by peeling it off and spreading it out, calling it beautiful, how it was like art or something. When she's done telling me all of that and I'm suitably freaked out, she starts calling me Pet and how she wanted me chained up at the end of her bed so she could do whatever she wanted with me. Now any other girl, I'd think that was incredibly kinky, but after what Lilith had just talked about, I really didn't think what she had in mind for me involved any kind of pleasure whatsoever. When it came to driving her home, she actually told me to stop a few blocks away from her house because she didn't want me to know exactly where it was that she lived at, saying that you couldn't be too careful these days with all the psychos in the world who use dating apps. Yep, she said that to me after she'd spent like an hour talking about all the ways she'd want to die or how she'd watch me die. As soon as I got home, I blocked her number. I've never been more scared of anyone like that before, let alone a girl I wanted to hook up with. So, Lilith, if you're reading this, let's not meet again. It happened during the summer vacation when I was 11. My parents and I always go to South India for at least one month to see the family. Now, during the whole month of June, there is what we call in our little village the Mango Festival, Mangani Festival. And it's a religious festival where divinity statues are exhibited in parades. There is a large alley filled all along with small temporary stands where people can buy a lot of different things like street food, fruits, toys, clothes and more, all at very cheap prices. My mom and I always go to these stores in the evening at around 5 or 6 when it was already dark because going during the daytime is just too exhausting with the unbearable heat plus the ground. At that time though, the alley is still very bright, lit up by the stores and decorative lights. That day, my mom decided to stop at the shoe flip-flop stand to buy me some. The seller proceeded to show my mom the collections and when he noticed my presence, he just locked his eyes on me. In the beginning, it didn't bother me much. I just thought that I might look like someone he knew. But he kept staring at me the whole time. He was picking his moment to stare at me and when my mom was looking in my direction, he'd stop and he'd stare back again when she looked away. It was obvious at that point though, and it made me very uncomfortable. Eventually, we had to leave without buying anything, but the seller insisted that we should come tomorrow because he had a new shipment of whatever new collections were arriving. Two days later, my mom called me to go to the festival stands, but I was reluctant to go this time. I told her I was genuinely tired and didn't want to go. But she yelled at me, saying that I was always lazy and wasting my summer vacation by staying at home all day. So I went with them. Our first shop was the cheap jewelry store. 
that my mom made me do something that I always hated. But she did it all the time in order to help me with my shyness. She said take my purse and go to the shoe stand by yourself and buy a pair that you like. I'll be watching you from here. I refused at first, but she progressively raised her voice. So to avoid being humiliated in front of other kids, I did what she said. When he saw me approaching his stand, he welcomed me with his unsettling smile. He proceeded to show me all his new sandals. And as I was his only customer, he even took the time to put the sandals on me, one by one, asking if they fit well. At that point, I just took whatever shoe quickly to get out of there. And now, it was a time for the checkup. I was and still am stressed to order or talk to a vendor. I used to stutter a lot during the social situations. But this time, it was different. It wasn't only stress and this gut feeling telling me that this man is strange and that I shouldn't be here with him alone. I handed him the money and was waiting for my change. But his demeanor suddenly changed. He became fidgety and showed frustration over the cash register. He then said that the cash register had broken for some unknown reason and that he wouldn't open. I glanced outside to see if my mom was still watching me and she was and when we made the eye contact she made a gesture with her hand telling me to hurry. She was observing at an angle and I was next to the cash register at the corner. I couldn't see a property anymore and at the same time the seller told me that he had another cash register in his trailer. So then he took my money and went there. It was a sort of open shop, so you could see his trailer if you were right in front of it. He went inside his trailer for a long time, and I could hear the voices of another person inside. They were talking, but I couldn't understand exactly what they were saying. So for around ten minutes, I was just standing there waiting awkwardly and peeking back at my mom occasionally to make her aware of my presence at the checkout. Then another client entered the shop and was looking at the merchandise. She asked me where the vendor was and I told her he was in the trailer. At the sound of our conversation, the vendor peeked from the trailer window and said to the woman, We aren't taking any more clients, ma'am. We were closing soon. The woman left soon after, but it seemed strange that he decided to close so suddenly and so early. It was only 6 p.m. and usually the shop is closed late between 8 or 9. I couldn't leave though as I was still waiting to get my change back. Then the vendor picked me up from his trailer's window again and said that he'd finally managed to get my change. He then made a sign with his hand as if to say come here. I wasn't sure about what he wanted so I said nothing and waited where I was awkward. After a moment, he peeked again and said, You can come now. I was confused. Why couldn't you just come outside and give me my change back? And why the hell he was taking so much time? I didn't say anything, but instead I peeked back outside to see my mom. And when she saw my concerned face, she finally decided to come and help me. I said to the seller, actually, I'm waiting for my mom. And when my mom entered the shop, the seller got out of his trailer almost immediately and handed my change back. He wasn't frustrated anymore, but smiling and very talkative, and even asked my mom if we were from here, to which she responded that we were from France and we were spending our summer vacation in our hometown. My mom and I went to other shops, but I could still see other clients coming to the shoe shop, even though he was going to close. By the time mom had finished her shopping, it was 8 p.m. and we were on our way back home. I could still see the lights from his shop when we got closer. And I couldn't even see he was using the same cashier that was supposed to be broken. At that age, I didn't realize how creepy this whole thing was. It just seemed odd and awkward. 
But years later, I finally realized that his gaze, his behavior, and his touches were all so wrong. And that night, I bet his intentions were even worse. Luckily, that night was the last time I ever saw him. And during the festival of the following year, I couldn't find his stand anymore. And his slot was occupied by a street food stand. So yeah, creepy shoe seller, let's never meet again, please.